Thanks for reading the startupfoundry.com. You're watching part two of our interview with Tim O'Reilly. Enjoy the show. Yeah, so I've just seen like your company is like continually on on the cutting edge. I mean, you're the guy that was, is credited for um, for coining the phrase Web 2.0. Um, and, and talk to us a little bit about Web 2.0. Like, what does that mean to you? Well, there were a couple of different layers of meaning. Uh, first off, I had been telling a story uh, for a number of years. It's really started uh, coming to me in the um, you know late 90s as I was doing advocacy for open source software. I started realizing that uh, software was becoming a commodity. And I was thinking a lot about the lessons of the IBM personal computer. You know, uh, for those of us who grew up in the early computer age, you know, I was originally like a mini computer guy. You know, <laughs> it's just like with Digital Equipment Corporation and, and so on. And the PC came along, and uh, and what happened was so amazing was that IBM was so dominant. They were more dominant in the industry of say the 70s and the early you know early 80s than Microsoft ever was. Uh, they had not, something like 93% market share of all computing. And there were seven other companies that divided up the other 7%. And uh, they didn't realize when they released a PC made out of off-the-shelf parts and published the specifications that they were creating the seeds of their own you know, demise as that dominant player. And, and that openness of their hardware specification meant, made it possible for people like Michael Dell to start a business when he was just in a dorm room, and you know, so so they they didn't they thought you know they'd sell a hundred thousand of these things, and they didn't realize it was going to become you know billions and billions of personal computers. So th their product, you know, computer hardware turned into a commodity, and software was just something that you you kind of threw in with the hardware. And so they made a deal to my, and gave away the rights to that to Microsoft. And of course, so software became very valuable, and Microsoft cornered the market on the operating system. And that led me eventually to an idea which Clayton Christensen later uh, ex expressed much more uh, succinctly as the law of conservation of attractive profits. He said, when something becomes commoditized, something else adjacent becomes valuable. Hmm. And uh, what I, uh, I was, you know, I hadn't formulated that neatly until uh, actually you know about 2003 when I started giving a talk called the open source paradigm shift and it was really about this idea that if you looked at that IBM uh, I started talking about this in the, say the late the, the late 90s but I really it really clicked for me around 2003 and I, I was saying look you know software is becoming a commodity in the same way that hardware became a commodity something else is going to become valuable and I wasn't completely clear what it was yet okay but so just hold that thought meanwhile I was I was really focused on uh, the idea that the internet was becoming a platform uh, I, I uh, and that started really with one of my editors had written a paper about the importance of Napster that everybody said oh it's just about file sharing and he said no no it's, it's about how somebody thinks when they think of the internet as a platform hmm. uh, you know it's like rather than having to put all the songs in one place you know you just kind of create a directory of the songs that people already have. And it was that inversion of thinking that got me going. And, and we were starting to see the early web services, you know, and proto web services where, you know, even people like us were, uh, you know, scraping sites to get data from them, using them as, so we'd had talk, we had a talk on that idea in our first Perl conference in 1997, this idea of using websites as, uh, you know, as services. And, uh, you know, the URL as, as a kind of command line and so we were thinking about all of that, uh, and in 2001, I actually did a conference, or 2002, I did a conference called Building the Internet Operating System. So those were the two threads, this commoditization of software uh, leading to something else becoming valuable, uh, the, uh, and then this idea of the Internet Operating System. And then um, in 2004, Dale Doherty, uh, uh, who's been with me since the practically the beginning of O'Reilly, really, my, my partner in it, uh, was actually in a brainstorming meeting with a, a company called, uh, which later became TechWeb, about wanting to do a conference together. And it was Dale who actually proposed the term Web 2.0. Hmm. And it was really around the idea that after the dot-com bust, uh, you know, it was clear that some companies had survived and others hadn't. 
And he was just talking about what was the web 1.0 versus web 2.0. If you look at my original web 2.0 paper, what is web 2.0 published in 2005, there's a table in there, which was what Dale had really come up with, you know, that we'd gone from, you know, say the idea of stickiness to the idea of syndication. We'd gone from the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, banner ads to, uh, you know, Google AdSense. You know, we, you know we'd gone from, uh, you know, having a portal to having to blogging. You know, there were various things that he kind of said, that was 1.0, this was 2.0. And I thought, oh, what a great name to wrap around these ideas of the Internet operating system. And somewhere in there, you know, I kept giving my, my open source paradigm shift talk, and it became more and more clear to me that the, the thing that was becoming valuable was large databases generated through user contribution and network effects. And that wasn't all of it. I mean, there's a lot of, of pieces. So, for example, if you go back and look, there's a, there's a, a talk I gave in 1999 at a conference called the Wizards of OS uh, in Berlin. Uh, with Richard, St uh, Richard Stallman in the audience. He was another speaker at the same conference. And he and I got into a kind of a tussle in the, in the Q&A. And, and uh, it was, it was uh, and I pointed out to him then, I said, look, Richard, if you had all of Google's software as free software, you still wouldn't have Google. There's something really different going on here, you know, because uh, you would need to have all of the pro business processes to keep getting the data. You know, somebody at Google that, you know, I had once had a conversation with someone at Google where I said, uh, oh, you know, of course, you got to remember this is 99, not, not, uh, it became obvious later. I said, you know, if you guys didn't keep fighting the spam and crawling the web, you know, Google would be out of date in, you know, you know, a few hours or a few days. And, and she said, oh, no, it'd be a few minutes, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, and I was so I said to Richard, it's clear that there's something going on beyond free software. You know, that, that we have to start thinking about the issues of, you know, what is freedom going to mean in a world where there's these massive sites on the net? And Richard actually said, oh, it doesn't matter because it's not on my computer, you know, which he later, of course, changed his tune on. But, uh, you know, you've got to remember, people weren't really getting yet the, the, the way things were shifting, that the internet. Uh, really is the platform. And in fact, when we first did the Web 2.0 conference in 2005, Bram Cohen of BitTorrent gave a talk making fun of the idea that the internet was becoming an operating system hmm. because it didn't have a, you know, all these various technical features that an operating system is supposed to have. But of course, when you have a device like this, it becomes pretty clear that the internet is the operating system. And the stuff that's here is just a device driver. So many of the apps uh, that are running on your phone are not on your phone. You know, if if you take the internet out of the equation, all of a sudden the phone doesn't doesn't do most of the things that matter to you. Yeah, sure, you can play some games, but um, so so even in this mobile era, you know, those ideas of Web 2.0 are still incredibly relevant. You know, that is user contribution, uh, thinking of the internet as a platform, bi building uh, data services and not just software. Uh, and of course, this does uh, uh, this kind of something very relevant for entrepreneurs, which is that a lot of the big internet subsystems are already fairly well developed. You know, I don't think somebody's going to come up with another mapping subsystem, for example. You know, and and if you look at the amount of data that Google has accumulated, uh, you know, you know that's like that area is game over. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you know, like the Google self-driving car exposed more of the data that they had collected they they photographed the road surface not just the you know the the, the buildings and uh, they have range finding to this you know at various points to the stop signs and the stop lights and you think about all the all the you know the resources that they have put into that you know and that's going to mean that you will be able to have things like self-driving cars uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't possibilities for innovation still, for example, in the mapping space. But you have to understand what's taken and what's not. You know, a great example of innovation in, in location is, uh, you know, was the introduction, which came from the city of Portland, not from an entrepreneur, was uh, what's now known as GTFS, the General Transit Feed Specification. That's the thing that lets you have Google Transit say, oh, yeah, that my, my train is arriving, you know, at, uh, at the station at, 954 and leaving, you know, that, that, and that was a nice little innovation. There's obviously a lot of innovation in local advertising, and, you know, things like Foursquare and, and uh, 
Gowalla. There's, uh, you know, but you still have to understand where, what's the state of the industry. Similarly, you know, you look at the social subsystem. You know, Facebook kind of is far enough along that you're not going to get another Facebook. You're going to get things that build on Facebook or fill in gaps in Facebook. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the Web 2 era was this initial land grab where people were figuring out some of the big blocks, uh, you know, of, of this Internet operating system. And now a lot of the big areas are taken, although not all of them, you know. So you look, for example, at that, so what you might call, say, the healthcare Internet. There's going to be this whole set of subsystems around health data, and that's a super, super cool area. Uh, and there's going to be other areas that we just haven't thought of. But, you know, what entrepreneurs have to do is either figure out holes in what's already there or figure out something that really is new and not just new, but useful. It's so important for people to uh, build something uh, that you know, isn't trivial, you know, and, and, and a lot of times, you know, I mean, there are lucky breaks, you know, like Twitter, where it was like, I don't think they, they realized just how important it was going to be. But if you look at Facebook, for example, I mean, Mark started with a very, very conscious use case at colleges, you know, and it was something that was going to be really useful to him and his friends. Uh, you know, with Foursquare, Dennis started with something that was really useful to, to you know, his particular demographic. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, again, I, I love the way when you when you talk to Mark, you really see he's he he, he's, he he understood that he's got his teeth into something interesting and he's kept developing it. And he's he's genuinely trying to figure out how far he can take it. But he's engaged with real problems. And I see it too many entrepreneurs. Um, there's a kind of paint by numbers mentality of, oh, so and so made a lot of money doing X. So we're going to do Y that's kind of like that, you know, and, and it's not really that real engagement with a market and a real engagement with user needs.